Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Catalyst webinar series. Today, our speakers will discuss the power of collaborative projects uh, in this webinar entitled Synergy in Science, answering key questions in cancer biology uh, through collaboration. We have invited current Damon Runyon scientists who are actively working to elevate investigator initiated projects through the promotion of team science. I am Megan Allen, Scientific Director of Damon Runyon Cancer Research Foundation. Damon Runyon's mission is simple. We fund the brave and the bold. We provide funding to brilliant young investigators, many of whom are in the room today, to enable them to perform high risk, high reward research that leads to breakthroughs in the treatment and understanding of all cancers. We have a long track record of success. And over the past 75 years, we have invested over $430 million in nearly 4,000 scientists. With that, I'm delighted to kick off the webinar by introducing today's moderator, Dr. Courtney Ellison, Assistant Professor at the University of Georgia in the Department of Microbiology. Dr. Ellison's research focuses on uncovering the ba basic mechanisms that control bacterial behaviors and their interactions with the environment. And with that, I'll, I'll hand, over, hand the floor over to Dr. Ellison. Uh, uh, but before I do, um, you can also use the Q&A um, mechanism in Zoom to submit your questions, and we'll get to those at the end of the, the session. Thank you very much, Dr. Ellison. Great. Thanks, Megan. Um, yeah, so I'm really excited to be here. It's my pleasure to be moderating this session um, on this exciting topic, probing how collaborative research can really help drive um, research forward to answer key questions in different facets of science, um, in particular cancer biology um, today. So um, I'm a classical microbiologist by training, and I study some of the mechanisms um, that bacteria use to infect hosts. So I'm particularly excited to learn about um, more of the biology and the collaborative research being done on the cancer side of, of research. Um, so with that, I'm going to introduce our panelists today. Um, we will have two teams who will each present for 20 minutes on their collaborative research programs. Um, first, we're going to have Dr. Luisa Escobar Hoyos and Dr. Mandar Muzumdar, who are both assistant professors at Yale. And then we will hear a presentation from Dr. Katya Vinadogrova at Rockefeller University and uh, Dr. Santosh Vardana, who is at the Parker Institute for Cancer Thera Immunotherapy. So I won't dig into their presentation time too much. Um, I will go ahead and turn it over to Luisa and Mandar. Uh, so thanks, Courtney, uh, for the introduction, and thanks to the Damon Runyon Cancer Research Foundation for giving us the opportunity to speak about um, our team building um, efforts at Yale uh, focused on pancreatic cancer. Um, I'm a physician scientist uh, and assistant professor of genetics um, at Yale University and part of the Yale Cancer Center, and I take care of patients with gastrointestinal cancers, including pancreas cancer, um, at the Yale Cancer Center. And I'll let Louisa say a word about herself. Thank you, Mandar. I am Luisa Escobar Hoyos. I am an assistant professor in the Department of Therapeutic Radiology, and also I have a joint ap appointment with the Department of Molecular Biophysics and Biochemistry, and I am a cancer biologist trying to understand pancreatic cancer with the hope to cure it very soon. Um, so I started at Yale in 2017. Uh, Luisa started two to three years um, afterwards, right before the pandemic. Um, and we, uh, together with, um, as you'll see, a, a really great group of people at Yale, started to think how we might uh, come together as a team to approach the problem of pancreatic cancer. And through this, we formed uh, the, pancreatic can the Yale Pancreatic Cancer Collaborative, which we term uh, Yale PAC. So why did we do this? Well, I think this slide nicely summarizes the rationale. So pancreatic cancer remains a major clinical problem. Over the last 20 years, we've seen dramatic reductions in overall cancer mortality with a 20% absolute reduction in cancer death rates. And this has really been driven by improvements in the mortality of four of the five leading causes of cancer-related death in the United States. Uh, that includes lung, breast, prostate, and colorectal cancer. And these uh, changes have really been driven by improvements in risk factor reduction, early detection, and better treatments. Now, it's pretty obvious that one of these things is not like the others, and that's pancreatic cancer, which continues to have a very high mortality rate and making it the third leading cause of cancer-related death in the United States, and it's anticipated to become the second uh, within the next few years. 
So clearly pancreatic cancer is a big problem. And so when Luisa and I were talking a few years ago, we thought that this is a big problem. We need big ideas and we need big teams to address this problem. And so we came up with a few guiding principles as we started to think about how to form a team science program specifically focused on pancreatic cancer. And I hope these are some of the, the key take home points that you get out of this uh, presentation. The first was that we needed to be inclusive. We needed to have a big tent. We knew that this problem required new approaches, new ideas, new strategies. And really to build those new strategies, we needed to break silos. We needed to bring disciplines together those in the clinical sciences, as well as the basic sciences, translational, epidemiologic, public health, and those in the engineering department, for example, uh, with those in the biology department. We needed those cross-disciplinary collaborations to think about new strategies to approach this big problem. The other thing that we realized very quickly uh, when we got to Yale is that there are a lot of schools, a lot of people, a lot of different schools, engineering school, medical school, undergraduate school, three different scientific campuses, lots of institutes and departments. And there may be individuals working in this space in pancreatic cancer or very keenly interested in this space, but who are totally unaware of what someone in another school or department or institution is doing. And so I think the assumption that everyone knows what everyone else is doing, even within the same institution is false. And one of the big things that we tried to do is just bring people together so they could start having those conversations and organically form collaborations. The third is, you know, both Luisa and I have been at Yale for less than six years. So we're relatively junior. Um, and I think it's important to know that uh, you're never too junior to be a catalyst for forming a team. In fact, what I learned is that sometimes the senior investigators perhaps are too invested, have very little time to really be catalysts for forming a team. And the junior investigators were bringing fresh ideas, fresh enthusiasm, perhaps are less jaded and bring fresh energy are those that are actually able to drive this process. So in other words, I'm saying that this team shouldn't have hierarchies. It should really be a peer colleague support system. The, the, third, the fourth thing that we, we uh, thought about was that we needed to be opportunistic. And in this case, as you'll see, COVID ended up being a very interesting opportunity to take advantage of. Um, so everything shut down. We were all at home. There were great opportunities to convert to a virtual format for bringing people together. And a lot of people had time suddenly that they didn't know they had before. They were no longer traveling to meetings. They no longer had uh, certain obligations from an academic standpoint. And so we took advantage of this to do a lot of team building and as you'll see educational efforts within our community. Um, and, uh, and those I think have borne fruit that we can now take advantage of going forward in this post, hopefully post pandemic world. Uh, and finally, I, I think uh, you'll hear about a great scientific collaboration in the second half of this talk, but I think collaboration is more than just working together on a particular project. So Luisa and I don't formally work on a specific scientific project in pancreatic cancer together, but we are part of a team that works very well together in many ways. And so Luisa and I share lots of ideas. We share uh, our grants with each other. We share our uh, collaborators with each other. We try and bring together and support each other in many different ways. That's not just a formal scientific collaboration. So I would say that it's a very important to share and that sharing goes beyond direct input and direct involvement in a scientific project. There's a lots of different ways of working together. So with those principles in mind, we started to form the team. And so again, big inclusive uh, tent. So we brought together a group of individuals interested in pancreatic cancer had already worked in the space or perhaps thought about doing so, but didn't have the expertise or the background to do so. We brought them all together. This included clinicians, translational researchers, basic researchers, and those in population health and epidemiology. And our hope was really to build cross-disciplinary teams. We wanted to take these teams and allow them to provide them the resources and the environment to enable team-based research grants to emerge. Ultimately, we would hope larger program project grants, multi-PI, RO1s, PO1s, and SPORs, not just us, but clearly Yale Cancer Center and the institution would very much appreciate having some of those grants as well. The other opportunity was we wanted to bring great Yale science to the bedside. And uh, it was clear that there weren't as many investigator initiated trials as they should be. And so one of the opportunities that COVID gave us, unfortunately, is that clinical trial enrollment dropped. But it also gives us an opportunity now to revive ourselves in a new way. Maybe less industry trials, more Yale science-based trials. And that's what we're trying to move towards. And finally, a major goal was to inspire trainees 
uh, towards a career in transitional GI cancer research. We really need to create the pipeline, the farm system per se, so that there will be more investigators going into the space and particularly in pancreas cancer. And we wanted that to make Yale a destination center for gastrointestinal cancers and in particular pancreas cancer, both in terms of clinical care, but also in terms of its research environment. And so there were a number of challenges we needed to meet uh, and face when we were trying to form this team. Clearly there are constraints on time and all individuals. There's, uh, there was clear lack of full institutional resources towards this particular problem. We needed to address that. There's clearly knowledge gaps and, and, not, and lack of awareness of who else was working in the space. And we wanted to create opportunities for career advancement and adequate recognition. And we want rewards in the end. We want to incentivize uh, the team to come together. And so these are our four pillars, uh, principles, which we'll go through uh, in a little bit of uh, detail. One was community building. Second was to create educational opportunities to educate our uh, investigators more broadly on the current uh, state of the art, uh, to create resources, both in terms of financial opportunities, but also in terms of preclinical models and infrastructure that they could take advantage of. And finally, to create new mechanisms for outreach and, and uh, talking about what we did. So in terms of community building, we started out by forming a steering committee. We wanted an interdisciplinary steering committee with many stakeholders. Um, so this included uh, the basic scientists as well as clinical translational researchers as shown here, included junior investigators, more senior colleagues, included uh, members of medical oncology, radiation oncology, surgical oncology, gastroenterology and pathology, all key stakeholders in pancreatic cancer research and clinical care. And we came up with a mission statement. The Yale PAC is an inclusive team of physician scientists and trainees that seeks to synergize the strengths of Yale science and clinical expertise to accelerate transformative research in pancreatic cancer. And we use this mission statement as a guiding light as we move forward in what we're doing. So I'll pass it over to Louisa to talk a little bit about our education, our community building education yeah, efforts. Thank you, Mander. Mander, if you can go one slide back, I just wanted to mention something. Out of this committee meeting, sorry, out of this steering committee, five of us had been at Yale less than five, six years, and we were all junior. And so this really speaks about the effort of combining junior and senior investigators and put them at the same in the same room to we all have a same goal during pancreatic cancer, but how can we all work together from our different areas of expertise? And so one of, uh, you know, from our discussions in the steering committee, we said one of the most important parts is to start building a larger community within the Yale environment. Next, Mander, please. And so we started to think, how can we bring people that maybe have an interest already in pancreatic cancer or have nice tools that we can already incorporate into pancreatic cancer research because maybe they had it applied in another cancer model. So the first community building activity that we did was to um, uh, form or establish this summit, what we call the Yale Pancreatic Cancer Summit, where we invited trainees and PIs that were in our community. All the ones that are listed here in red are actually trainees or scientists that had an interest of you know, learning more about pancreatic cancer because they wanted to bring their expertise into this disease. And everyone that is listed in, in Black Fund, we were all more scientists that have been working on pancreatic cancer. The goal of this was to bring different scientists that we were all sitting at home, but we had great ideas and maybe we just wanted to share a little bit more of our expertise and try to incorporate in being inclusive, as Mander said. So we had over 130 participants, a third of them were actually trainees. And this was so exciting because we had people from multiple departments, 16 departments from three different institutes from the Cancer Center. So it was a great opportunity for people to just discuss ideas and be creative on how to establish this community. Next. And from you know, talking with scientists within our own institution, we can start actually building multidisciplinary teams. We have here a couple of examples. One is of Mander. Mander, when he came uh, to Yale, he started attending, you know, the different programs and the different seminars that uh, the Cancer Center had, that other departments had, which allowed him to establish a multi-collaborative team of different di disciplines. So he was trying to understand how there is this crosstalk between the exocrine and the endocrine pancreatic cells to drive pancreatic cancer. And so for this, he collaborated with Richard Kitty from the endocrinology department and also from Smita Krishwami, who's also in the Department of Genetics and does a lot of computational biology for single cell RNA sequencing. On my side, 
uh, when I came and I started presenting actually at the summit that I just mentioned, I started reaching out to people during the summit and I said, you know, Jeff Townsend, it would be great if we can collaborate. I know you're doing this. I just heard your talk and I have this other project that I think we can actually start collaborating. The same with uh, John Kunzman, who's our surgical oncologist for pancreatic cancer. It's actually one of two surgical oncologists. And, you know, again, this is how we started building these teams within, within our community. Um, and it's important to, you know, as junior PIs and even as trainees, to not be afraid to reach out. We are actually in academia because we have this sense of wanting to build a community, wanting to educate, wanting others to grow as much as we can uh, and support each other. Next. And, and just to comment, these two projects were both funded through innovation awards by the Damon Runyon Cancer Research Foundation. Very important. Thank you, Mender. Yes. Let me tell you about another project that actually was not funded through the Damon Runyon, but it's a project that we started thinking from within uh, our, our, our leader, uh, our steering meetings, which is how can we come together from different areas and start developing a project that is actually between us that started at Yale. And so we wanted to start identifying one of the most important clinical needs that pancreatic cancer needs right now is how can we stratify for pancreatic, how can we stratify chemotherapy per the patient? Next. So the most common form of pancreatic cancer is pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma or PDAC. And we know that once the patients come in and they are diagnosed, oncologists will have to make the decision between either assigning them with demabraxane or with Volcirinox. These both type of chemotherapies are very different, Gemabraxin being a little bit less aggressive, Volcirinox being a little bit more aggressive. But the problem right now that we're facing in the clinic is we really don't know how to assign the best chemotherapy for each patient. There are no biomarkers. Next. And unfortunately, we know that there are some patients that respond to gemabraxin, other that, others that don't. The same case with Volcirinox. And the problem with this is that a lot of the patients will go and have the treatment with a lot of side effects, unfortunately, that can actually be detrimental to their survival. Next. So what are the challenges to develop a biomarker to decide the best treatment for pancreatic cancer patients? Well, there are several, and there are multiple at the clinic. Well, only 10 to 15% of the cases will be eligible to have a resection and have a surgery to uh, remove their tumor. Unfortunately, the majority of the patients will not be eligible. 85% of the patients will only have a biopsy or a fine needle aspiration made out of their tumors. And unfortunately, a lot of these samples so far, a lot of these samples uh, will have very few malignant cells within that sample. And why is this? Well, it turns out that if you have a pancreatic tumor mass, only 10% of the cells that are in that mass are actually pancreatic cancer cells. So that leaves us with a very challenging situation in terms of sampling uh, so we can actually assess the biomarker. But the other challenge within our community that we know is that in order to bring a biomarker all the way from the bench to the clinic and to trials, it really requires multidisciplinary teams. So how did we go about these challenges and this need to develop a biomarker to decide best treatment? Next. So we knew that first we needed to develop a test that could work for the majority of pancreatic cancer patients, a test that could be done on those biopsies or fine needle aspirations. That is probably the only sample that we're going to have from that patient. And so through um, in collaboration with our gastroenterologist, we can actually uh, um, acquire that sample, that biopsy or that fine needle aspiration from the tumor. And we develop this test next that it's an IHC-based test. It's, it's an immunodetection system to recognize or to identify the expression of this embryonic keratin, which is called keratin-17. In the work that I had done as a graduate student, I had identified through proteomics analysis of these tumors that actually keratin-17 is one of those proteins that is elevated in almost more than 300-fold in those cases or those tumors that are very aggressive and potentially non-responsive to treatment. And so what we did was to develop, go the way from all that proteomic basic science discovery to develop an IHC test that, I could, that could actually work in these very small samples that we had from the patients. Next. 
And so as I, as I mentioned before, our goal was to develop this test to see if it can inform us of response of chemotherapy in pancreatic cancer patients. So we did this retrospective analysis where we actually collaborated very closely with our oncologists, with our surgical oncologists, um, with our um, cytopathologists, gastroenterologists to look retrospectively at patients that had come to Yale and that had either received fulfirinox or dem demcytobine abraxane and try to identify how this biomarker correlated with outcome. And here in this graph, what you have is actually the Kaplan-Meier curve of the low keratin-17 cases, those cases whose tumors had very little expression of keratin-17. And what we can see here from these curves is that pretty much all low keratin-17 uh, tumors they respond very similarly to fulfirinox and dimcitabine based on the survival of the patient. However, next, on the high keratin-17 cases, it's actually a very dramatic difference. What we found is that those, those tumors that have high expression of keratin-17 are more responsive to when they are giving fulfirinox than when they are giving gemabraxine, suggesting that the high keratin-17 expression in a tumor could actually guide and determine what would be the best therapy for patients. And based on this research, it would be fulfirinox. This is still a working process and we're very excited because we're now expanding this research. We're actually now using keratin-17 in the country in three different clinical trials to see if they can inform the response to chemotherapy, not only at Yale, but also in other centers. This is important, as I mentioned before, and I have been uh, kind of hinting on all of these people, but we're really excited because this is a this is a project that started three years ago in collaboration, as I said, with oncologists, pathologists, gastroenterologists, surgeons, and very importantly, the team, my, my team here, the four members of my team that are working on them, is they're actually trainees, MSCP student that wants to be an oncologist, an MD student who wants to be a surgical oncologist, and a resident in pathology. Um, and so this is very important because it gives them the opportunity to start already working very close-handed with all the clinicians and who they are actually aiming to be in the years to come. Next. On education. So this is a very important pillar. As I mentioned, we have trainees in our lab. We have a larger community that really wants to understand pancreatic cancer. Why is it so lethal? How can we collaborate? And in order to build more team science that it's just outside of Yale from the examples that I just gave you, we wanted to start doing this collaborative seminar series. And so we have done so far two. The first one, one in 2020 to 21. And here you can see we have a large diverse community of speakers, um, women, men, clinical, translational, basic science, and this is so important because I remember when Mander and I, we were reaching to all these very well-established clinicians, scientists, they said, yes, sure, right away. I would love to help you. I would love to learn what else is at Yale that is happening. How can we help you? For me as a junior PI, I was very excited to see that people that I had always looked up to were actually eager to help us disseminate the need for pancreatic cancer research and kind of establish this pipeline to exchange ideas. Next. And more recently, this was our second seminar series where again, we had uh, a, a very, a big array of scientists, clinicians who shared with us our research. And we were actually glad because in only until 21, 22, we were able to have the speakers on site to have lunch with the trainees, to share one-on-one -on -one in-person meetings with the collaborative uh, group that we already had built at Yale. Next. So, so far we've talked about building our community and educating our community, bringing them up to a certain level of knowledge so that they can be effective in terms of addressing this problem. But we really need to incentivize these teams to form and to, and to do the work. And so we thought about two ways of building resources for them. One is uh, tissue-based resources that includes tissues for analysis, but also tissue-based models. And so working with our tumor gastrointestinal biobank uh, at Yale, as well as several departments, including surgery, Yale pathology, and lab medicine. We've been working to create a biobank of tumor tissue for analyses, as well as preclinical models, pre, uh, patient-derived xenografts, PDXs, as well as patient-derived organoids, or PDOs. We've also been trying to connect these resources to investigators with really fantastic spatial genomics technologies that have been developed at Yale. This allows us to do uh, spatial genomics um, analysis for gene expression, as well as protein and DNA sequencing, 
These are just a couple of examples. One, MENA, the other one, DBITSEQ that have been developed by investigators Stephen Wang and Rong Feng here. And we're trying to use these on, again, those precious limited samples that we have from pancreas cancer biopsies. Can we get as much information as possible from these limited samples, taking advantage of advances in next generation sequencing technologies? We also needed to bring money. So we created a seed grant program. We were eager to get some money. And so we talked to the cancer center, we talked to the hospital system, and they all realized it was a big problem and they needed to contribute to it. And so we convinced them to support a seed grant program. This is really to build teams uh, to support nascent research. So new or existing projects in very early stages to formalize collaborations and allow them to develop preliminary data, um, identify trainees who are, uh, who are invested in this research that allow them then to be more competitive for external and competitive grant submissions. And we wanted this to be a team and we wanted it to be interdisciplinary. So we mandated that the proposals had to come from two or more faculty level PIs, and again, had to be from different disciplines, basic clinical population health, departments or institutions, similar to what we had seen in the summit. There was a lot of interest from many disciplines. We now wanted to give them resources to be able to execute on that mission. And we wanted to be inclusive. So we allowed a wide range of projects, classical basic translational work, correlatives in part of a clinical trial, and even process improvement and implementation science research. And we were very pleased to see that we got a wide variety of proposals and were able to fund several of them in the first year and we're continuing in future years as well. And finally, we wanted to advertise. This allowed us to give recognition to those within our center who are doing great work, uh, but also to provide an opportunity for philanthropic funding. And so to do this, we took advantage of various avenues, classical sort of print-based magazines, including the Breakthroughs Magazine, which is Yale Cancer Center's annual year in review, they did a whole feature article on, uh, on our um, Yale PAC uh, community. And if you look closely, and if you can read that, Luisa's names there, including a quote. Um, and then we also took advantage of new technologies for disseminating uh, information, including Twitter, uh, as part of our Center for GI Cancer's handle, and been using these to, to advertise again, and have, as a result, have been able to start to look at new sources of philanthropic funding as well. So I hope over the last 20 minutes or so, we've been able to convince you that you know, a lot is possible. Um, we, I think we've laid a foundation for a pancreatic cancer program here at Yale, certainly very much in its early stages, but I think we are now uh, poised to really do some remarkable things over the coming years. Great, and thank you, Luisa and Mandar. That was super cool. Um, I'm gonna turn it over now to Katya and Santosh. Um, so you guys go ahead and take it away. Um, thank you, Courtney. Um, so uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, our collaboration where we're trying to um, find the um, previously unknown post-translational drivers of uh, um, immune cell dysfunction, specifically T-cell dysfunction, in the context of uh, um, chronic antigen stimulation as well as tumor microenvironment. Um, but we wanted the uh, but considering the nature of this uh, presentation, we also wanted to tell a little bit about the background of where we're both coming from and uh, our background and how the, this collaboration started. Um, so I was born and raised in Moscow, Russia, and my education in, um, in uh, Russia was actually primarily chemical synthesis and organometallic chemistry. Uh, and I was uh, um, a part of a lab uh, that collaborated with another lab in France, but I also did a number of internships mostly focused on organometallic chemistry. Uh, I further pursued my PhD studies uh, at, at MIT with Stephen Buckwald, uh, where we also collaborated with another lab uh, at MIT that was uh, a relatively new lab at MIT, Brad Pantaludi's lab, on the development of organometallic chemical biology reagents uh, for uh, bioconjugation approaches. Uh, I then moved on uh, to Scripps to pursue my postdoctoral studies with Ben Kravat, uh, uh, where in collaboration with John Tejaro, uh, also a younger faculty at Scripps Research Institute, uh, we were interested in taking advantage of uh, chemical proteomic strategies uh, to learn a little bit more about molecular landscapes in uh, T cells and T cell activation, um, which led me to uh, starting my independent career and opening the lab uh, uh, at the Rockefeller University, uh, at the end of uh, 2020, where our lab is uh, the lab of chemical immunology and proteomics. 
Uh, and as a theme for my uh, educational background, I guess, is that throughout uh, my uh, scientific career, um, there were a number of enabling collaborations that uh, really allowed me to diversify uh, my science and uh, uh, really take an interdisciplinary approach towards specific scientific questions. Uh, and at Rockefeller, we're a lab that is interested in uh, taking advantage of the chemical proteome platforms and uh, um, uh, including new chemical tool development and advances in the proteome platforms to uh, understand misregulation of protein, uh, functional, functional and structural changes in the proteins uh, that lead to misregulation of signal pathways and uh, uh, dysfunctional immune cell states with a specific focus on uh, state-dependent chemical immunology and neuroinflammation. Hi, everybody. Um, so yeah, a little bit about myself and, and my journey uh, before Katya and I started this collaboration. Um, my uh, education was, I guess, a little bit more geographically restricted, uh, especially after I graduated from college. It's mostly up and down First Avenue in Manhattan. Um, so I started as a technician in Stephen Whitkin's lab um, after I graduated from college, and uh, he worked on the inflammation of adverse pregnancy outcomes. And this was actually like the first time I had ever fully grasped the idea that understanding core um, basic scientific concepts could actually be applied to human disease and that actually studying fundamental biology could um, uh, really lead to uh, therapeutic initiatives. So that really solidified my desire to pursue an MD PhD. And so I went downtown to NYU. I joined the medical scientist training program there. And for my PhD, I worked with uh, Mike Dustin, uh, uh, who's a PhD and he studies uh, T cell receptor uh, signal initiation and termination through this cell cell communication called the immunological synapse. And again, uh, you know, I, I joined a lab like this really on purpose. And, and the idea was that I really wanted to solidify my bona fides as an immunologist and understand the uh, the core principles that tell a T cell when to activate or stand down, hopefully being able to apply that therapeutically in the future. Uh, once I finished my PhD, I went on to complete medical school and then do my internal medicine residency and medical oncology fellowship, again, a short trip back uptown um, at New York Presbyterian Hospital and uh, my medical oncology fellowship at uh, Sloan Kettering. And then I did my postdoc in Craig Thompson's lab um, again, it, it's sort of in keeping uh, with sort of the way I had grown to think about science, joining the lab of somebody who also really believed in understanding core principles of biology as a first step to therapeutic initiatives. And in his lab, I really studied metabolic regulation of stem cell identity and T cell exhaustion. It's really the convergence of those three factors that led me to start my own lab um, at St. Kettering um, in uh, late 2020, early 2021. And so what we tried to do in my lab is kind of what um, the way I'd been trained, which is to try and really understand core immunological concepts and apply them to clin clinically relevant contexts. So the first main area of focus in the lab is um, understanding molecular drivers of altered T cell metabolism. So this comes from my background in Mike Dustin's lab studying T cell receptor signaling, and we want to understand how that sets the metabolic landscape of T cells. The second area of interest in the lab is then trying to understand how when a T cell that's been metabolically programmed enters an environment that is unfamiliar, such as in a tumor, particularly um, nutrient unfavorable tumors, such as pancreas cancer, but also what we'll be talking about lung cancer, how that alters T cell behavior. The third uh, project is to really keep that in the human context and apply the lessons that we learn in either model systems, uh, either in vitro systems or mouse models to primary patient tissues. And the fourth, in case I didn't mention, I'm actually a physician scientist and clinically I'm a lymphoma doctor. So we have kind of a fourth offshoot idea, which is to understand immune dysfunction and hematologic uh, cancers. But really the first, the intersection of the first three areas will be um, uh, what Katja and I talk about uh, today and what really brought us together for this project. So collaboration began uh, slightly over two years ago uh, when uh, I was establishing my lab at the Rockefeller University, or I was just planning, I guess, to establish my lab at the Rockefeller University. And we had just uh, reported uh, um, uh, our uh, kind of discovery that uh, chemical proteomic platforms can be applied to um, study um, post-translational landscapes in, uh, in proteomes and that 
uh, these broadly reactive chemical probes can really read out the changes in structure and function of some proteins. And uh, that, that there are a number of these post-translational changes in T cells undergoing um, T cell activation. Uh, and we also found that uh, a number of immune relevant proteins in T cells, both in quiescent cell states and activated cell states, had these residues and pockets that could be targeted with small molecule covalent electrophiles, something that uh, uh, the breadth of it hasn't really been appreciated before and really opened a lot of opportunities for future uh, modulation of protein function and specifically immune protein function with small molecule covalent electrophiles. So I was very excited to be starting at Rockefeller and uh, especially because of the proximity of uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering and thinking about um, um, potential um, stud uh, future potential studies uh, of uh, post-translational landscapes in immune cell dysfunction, specifically relevant to uh, human disease and in particular cancer. So uh, yeah, so this is like the first insight into how our collaboration started. Um, so uh, basically at the same time uh, uh, that Katya was publishing this paper, I was finishing up my postdoctoral work. And you know what we were, what I was trying to do in my postdoctoral work is really trying to understand early events that drive this T cell dysfunction that happens when T cells have to repetitively encounter tumor cells. And one of the challenges with trying to understand metabolic changes in T cells is that it's very difficult to understand it in in vivo systems because by the time you take the T cells out, they their biology changes, and so you can't really understand them very well. So I'd spent a lot of time building these reductive systems to generate like boatloads of T cells that looked exhausted, and that would allow us to do really sophisticated metabolomic profiling. And we had uncovered a critical role for cysteine availability in driving T cell exhaustion. And uh, I don't like to be in the business of like plugging Twitter more broadly, but I but I will say that I found out about. Katya's work uh, because she uh, tweeted about her preprint um, and uh, it was incredibly exciting. I, I had not really seen anybody um, uh, uh, talk about uh, post-translational modification of um, uh, residues and activated T cells and that this is a strategy to actually um, identify novel targetable um, uh, residues for, for immunotherapy. And so, you know, this is kind of one of the first things that I think is important, especially when you're building an interpersonal collaboration, which is like, be open and receptive to ideas, like read and look out for new interesting things. And if you see something interesting that you think might be the source of a new cool idea, like don't be afraid to just reach out to another person. I had never met Katya before. We didn't know each other at all. And um, uh, basically I just reached out to her and I was like, hey, your work is awesome. Would you be interested in working on something together? And um, that was two years ago. And so we we had this first meeting, mostly based on that, because I essentially, you'll see later, but I sent her my one and only direct message over Twitter um, about her work. And we had a Zoom meeting and we decided actually this would be an incredibly fruitful collaboration um, to sort of think about how T cells could be modified via mechanisms outside of what a lot of people think about in immunology, which is either like, you know, chromatin modifications or transcriptional regulation to really think about the post translational landscape of T cell exhaustion. But, you know, we really did also want to keep an eye towards things that would be therapeutically relevant. So we started wondering okay, these are things that we care about in the land of fundamental biology. What clinical problems can we use this to address? And so, you know, we started talking a lot about the successes and failures of immunotherapy, especially for solid tumors. And uh, those of you watching may or may not know the two real paradigm shifting therapies in terms of immunotherapy for cancer have been immune checkpoint blockade and chimeric antigen receptor transduced T cell therapy. Immune checkpoint blockade reinvigorates uh, your own T cells to fight um, uh, tumor cells via recognition of uh, neoantigens or other mutated proteins. And uh, chimeric antigen receptor transduced T cells uh, involves uh, engineering T cells to recognize one particular antigen that might be present on a tumor cell. And there have been some spectacular successes with these treatments, but I think objectively we could say still in the majority of cases, patients don't respond to treatment. So why don't they respond? That seemed like a really you know, a meaningful place for us to start to think about attacking. So who fails to respond to immune checkpoint blockade? Uh, essentially, it's patients whose T cells get exhausted. And so for those of you who don't know, T cell exhaustion is a program that's been described for now 
35 years, originally described during chronic viral infections and later found to be seen in T cells infiltrating tumors. It's an entire epigenetic and transcriptional program that results in T cell dysfunction. And unfortunately, immune checkpoint inhibitors don't reverse this process. In terms of chimeric antigen receptor therapy, uh, a hint as to why CAR T cells don't work when they don't work comes from where they do work. So I'm actually a blood cancer doctor and CAR T cells are amazing for blood cancers. They're great in uh, lymphoid leukemias, they're great in diffuse large B cell lymphomas, and uh, they're terrible in solid tumors. To date, I don't think we've seen any objective responses with CAR T cells in solid tumors at all. Um, and that really raises the possibility <clears throat> that it's something in the environment that's limiting, limiting the ability of these CAR T cells to function. So when Katya and I started thinking about where we could work together, we we're like, well, why don't we try to target two major questions? One, can we prevent the development of T cell exhaustion to enable immune checkpoint blockade? And two, can we understand how the environment actually suppresses T cell function, maybe even in ways that are outside of the traditional exhaustion program? And we really thought that the post-translational landscape would be an exciting way to attack this. Yeah, so trying to go beyond the transcriptional and epigenetic uh, changes and looking into post-translational drivers or changes uh, in uh, different uh, uh, levels of exhaust, T cell exhaustion, we thought that using chemical proteomic approaches will be an enabling to see some of these uh, uh, molecular ch changes in the protein landscapes. Uh, and so I'll just uh, briefly introduce some of the chemical proteomic platforms that our, uh, my lab uses to interrogate broadly uh, landscapes and different immune cell states uh, uh, to try to identify unique and uh, uh, differential uh, um, changes in um, reactivity of specific uh, amino acid residues. So uh, we can apply these platforms uh, in uh, um, non-engineered uh, um, uh, cells uh, in native biological systems. And this allows us to uh, very easily work with patient samples. And uh, by using these broadly reactive uh, cysteine or lysine targeting probes that have enrichment uh, handles, we can target proteins from uh, different protein classes uh, which uh, really allows us to look uh, uh, beyond just the uh, you know active sites of enzymes, but also at transcription factors and adapter proteins, for example. And we get the quantitative information about potency and selectivity of this engagement, uh, as well as engagement of uh, uh, specific residues with more elaborated covalent electrophiles. And recent advances in the development of these technologies really allow uh, uh, great levels of multiplexing and depths for coverage. Um, so there's a number of different uh, types of uh, uh, proteomic uh, uh, platforms that we use. And depending on how you set it up, you can get different types of information from them uh, by looking at the differences in signal intensities uh, using our mass spectrometer uh, in the lab. And if we don't use any enrichment strategies, we can just uh, look at the uh, expression changes uh, in the proteins in uh, immune cells in different cell states, in this case, uh, T cells, uh, whether they're chronically stimulated and exhausted or uh, exhausted within the context of tumor microenvironment. Um, on the contrary, if you introduce uh, uh, the so-called uh, reactive, broadly reactive uh, chemical probes, uh, you can uh, uh, look at the reactivity of specific cysteine residues and how it changes in different uh, um, microenvironments. Uh, and we think that the reactivity can be uh, changing due to bo both global and local microenvironments that can be affected by um, cellular microenvironment, but also structural or functional changes in the proteins. And we think this is a, a, an interesting complementary strategy that's uh, a PTM agnostic way of reading out these changes in proteins. Uh, and the, um, lastly, we also use scout fragments, these uh, small molecule covalent electrophiles that have an affinity element to them shown in black and a reactivity group shown in red that allows us to broadly evaluate the uh, ligandability of specific sites, uh, proteome wide in, in proteins. And so we thought that this could be a, a complementary approach to existing strategies that could really highlight the post-translational regulation of protein function, provide new biological insights in, into T cell exhaustion and potentially open new opportunities for uh, small molecule chemical probe uh, development. So, you know, um, so so we we started on this collaboration um, as our like labs were still sort of unpacking from boxes. And I, I think that this is also a really hopefully valuable piece of 
advice or information for people starting new collaborations is that the best way to make them work from the jump is to have open and frequent communication because frequently with these collaborations you're not just trying to say like well let's use something that you do and use something that i do you're actually trying to build something brand new and when you do that there's going to be like lots of troubleshooting and so you know one of the first things we were trying to do with our platform was to say okay we were able to generate lots of exhausted t cells in vitro from mice could we do the same thing in human um it was not an like intuitive transition immediately it took time it took op optimization it took texting daily between us as we tried to get the protocol to work but ultimately we were able to generate a robust highly controlled scalable platform that generates t cells that look essentially superimposable with T cells that you see infiltrating tumors. Um, and so you take primary human T cells, we activate them, and we either act, uh, expand them conventionally, those are what we call acutely stimulated T cells, or we expose them to persistent antigen in combination with a specific exhaustion protocol. We call those chronically stimulated, and you can see the chronically stimulated T cells lose effector cytokine capacity. Uh, they uh, activate inhibitory immunoreceptors such as LAG3 and downregulate memory associated transcription factors such as TCF1. And when you do RNA sequencing on these cells, you can see that the cells go off on very separate trajectories, and the tra trajectories that the chronically stimulated T cells go on end up in places very similar to what you see from exhausted T cells from more traditional models, such as tumor infiltrating T cells uh, from mice or else, uh, exhausted T cells uh, um, um, isolated from mice bearing uh, chronic viral infections. And so once we had built that platform, we really started to iterate and improve upon it to ask more complex questions. And the first complex question that we wanted to ask was, well, what happens when a T cell that's being activated is exposed to an unfavorable environment? Does it undergo the same type of transcriptional and functional changes that happens when a T cell gets exhausted in the way that everybody else thinks about T cells getting exhausted? So if we were going to do that, we actually needed to recruit another collaborator into our group. Um, and so we were very fortunate to work with a thoracic surgeon, Dr. Prasad Adusamili, who happens to also be a CAR T cell expert, as well as being a thoracic surgeon who focuses on uh, lung adenocarcinoma and one of the most devastating complications of lung adenocarcinoma, which is the development of malignant pleural effusions. For those of you who don't know, if you develop a malignant pleural effusion from lung adenocarcinoma, your prognosis is extremely poor. And these patients have very little to no response to immune checkpoint inhibitors, which is what we wanted to understand. And Prasad had seen something really interesting in his preclinical models, which is that when he would make CAR T cells to try and attack lung cancers and infuse them into mice, as soon as they encountered pleural fluid, they like completely lost their ability to function. But he didn't know whether this was from exhaustion or some other problem. So we decided, okay, we're gonna use our newly developed system to test this. And so we did that, we exposed T cells that were either being activated conventionally or exhausted in vitro to control media or media in the presence of a pleural effusion. Uh, from uh, isolated from three different patients with lung adenocarcinoma. And what you can see in the bottom right is that um, uh, the presence of pleural effusion has a synergistic suppressive effect on the ability of T cells to engage in an anti-tumor response. You can see that even in the acutely stimulated settings, they dramatically lose their ability to produce cytokines and under persistent um, antigen stimulation, they completely lose their ability to engage in cytotoxic T cell function. But if you look on the right, which is a principal component analysis of RNA sequencing from these cells, what you can see is that you still retain this sort of canonical exhaustion trajectory. If you look at the day four and day eight chronically stimulated cells, it kind of goes from the upper right over to the left and then up into the upper left. That's kind of your traditional exhaustion um, trajectory. And then you can see that all the other arrows kind of go down towards that bottom area. And what that tells you is essentially that the presence of pleural fluid is suppressing T cell responses, and it has very little to no effect on their transcriptional landscape, suggesting to us even more strongly that the way that this extracellular environment is suppressing T cell function is via mechanisms that are not regulated on either the chromatin level or the transcriptional level, which is very exciting for us because that's kind of like the source of our whole collaboration. And so we thought this was a really exciting area to start doing uh, uh, deeper proteomic analyses. 
And so just one sneak peek of the proteomic data that we'll show due to the lack of time uh, um, is uh, we also applied the, the system and uh, uh, took advantage of the uh, multiplexing capacity uh, um, of the tandem mass uh, tags, um, uh, isobaric tags for uh, sample multiplexing. And we compared the, the different ways of stimulation in the presence of uh, uh, pleural effusion fluid and uh, um, in regular controlled media with chronic antigen stimulation or without chronic antigen stimulation. And what we saw is that uh, uh, at the protein level, there are actually pretty clear differences uh, in the uh, PCA analysis uh, where we see a clustering of the um, samples that are grown and stimulated acutely in the presence of pleural fusion uh, fluid, even at day two after the initial stimulation but then a much, uh, much uh, more significant uh, uh, clustering of the, um, of the samples that were acutely stimulated in the presence of pleural fusion, uh, pl pl pleural fluid um, at uh, day five of stimulation. And we see that chronically stimulated uh, cells uh, under regular conditions cluster uh, together and then acutely stimulated cells uh, without the uh, fluid also cluster together. Uh, and so we have a lot more proteomic data that we are not going to, sh uh, to share today, uh, but because uh, um, we wanted to um, focus uh, a little bit on uh, the, the questions that uh, one might have uh, when, uh, when you are starting initiating a collaboration. And some of this <laughs> has already been covered by Luis and Mandar um, and uh, by Santos throughout the presentation, but we just wanted to kind of uh, have our bullet points of uh, uh, of the types of collaborations and uh, how to begin a collaboration and uh, what are the key components of making a successful collaboration. Yeah, um, so so we're we're so lucky that uh, that we were able to sort of share this presentation with Luisa and Mandar and, and uh, you guys really beautifully summarized how to grow sort of like a, a, a a complex, like multidisciplinary group to attack large problems in cancer. Um, and you know, I think that when one is thinking about starting any sort of collaborative effort in science, the first thing that we would say is like, hey, like you should do it. It's one of the most wonderful things about science is sort of like sharing and learning new things from uh, your colleagues who become friends and uh, uh, people who spend their life devoted to elements of science that, you know, you you don't know that much about and and that that can actually like grow what you're interested in by by working with them but in that sense what, what you really want to figure out at the outset of a collaboration is like what's the scope and the scale of the type of collaboration that you want to build is this like a core idea that you're thinking about that might be merging the expertises of two labs kind of like mine and Katja's is this something that you're like we really need to make this like not just intra-departmental but interdepartmental um, across several different disciplines across like you know the different like sort of scientific areas and then you need to sort of like scale your context to the to the, the level of the collaboration that you're trying to build um and then once you decide the sort of scope um and and you know there are, there are plenty of factors that we can talk about that probably go into this including what your capacity is to take on collaborations of relative sizes the next most important and maybe the most important thing to do is you know identify the people that you want to work with and and make sure that the people that you want to work with are are not only provide like the the intellectual resources and or like background that's important to build um, a collaboration but i really can't emphasize this enough you know people with whom you feel simpatico about the way you approach science like you know sort of like even like fr from the lofty ideas to the actual nitty gritty of how you pursue the work. And the best way to find that out is to just like reach out to people and engage them in conversation, try to find common ground on an idea that inspires both of you and then start talking functionally about how to build that project together. And this is so that's, the, I, that's my idea. The, yes, the 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 tweet that I dug out from uh, from my Twitter from uh, from Santosh. And I guess uh, it is important to have a uh, team vision uh, because excitement about science is what drives us to uh, uh, to pursue science and to uh, um, uh, push uh, in different directions within the same projects um, and be excited about uh, sharing data and. Uh, I guess it, uh, Santosh already said that, that people are important uh, um, who you are collaborating with and 
I think we can stress enough the open communication and transparency. We are very uh, 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 good at uh, uh, sharing data right away as soon as the, uh, as we get it and troubleshooting as we go. Um, and um, distinct uh, complementary strengths of the labs is also an important, uh, I think, uh, um, uh, part of the collaboration. And of course, uh, the institution's uh, physical proximity is important uh, and enabling, but not essential. Um, and the uh, uh, history of prior collaborations between institutions might also be important because as scientists, we don't uh, think about this, these things, but there, there are a lot of uh, things that go into place uh, when you're establishing a collaboration on more of a bureaucratic level and uh, they're having institutes that have that path uh, is, is very important and enabling. And here, us being a part of the tri-institutional system where MSK, uh, Rockefeller, and Will Cornell have an extensive uh, history of collaboration is very enabling. Um, and I think uh, Luisa and Mandar already covered some of the funding opportunities for, for larger uh, um, um, multi-PI uh, grants. Uh, but there are also a number of opportunities, uh, funding opportunities for teams of, of two people, for example, including the uh, the Damon Runyon funding that uh, me and Satish have, so that uh, we're really grateful for. Um, and uh, another enabling part of the collaboration is the motivated and excited people in the labs that, that we also wanted to acknowledge. Awesome, thank you guys. Um, that was a really nice way to end the presentation to transition over into the panel and discussion part of this webinar. Um, so my first question is going to be for Luisa and Mandar. I really love the emphasis that you guys have on trainees in this collaborative community that you've built. Um, what advice do you have for young trainees who might want to set up a collaboration with a senior scientist? Do you want to go first? <laughs> sure. <laughs> I would say that uh, I think the thing that I would suggest is not to be hesitant. Just go for it. Um, I think what Santosh did with uh, with Katya was sort of one of those go for it type things with the, the DM. Well, you could do the same for more senior scientists. They may not respond to you. <laughs> they may take a while to respond to you, but I think you're never going to make that relationship or make that collaboration work or even, again, find out whether the personalities mix until you actually give it a chance and opportunity. Yeah. I will say that I think it's important to highlight some of the unique aspects that you bring. So, for example, when um, I started at Yale, you know, I had pancreatic cancer models, um, but was interested in the endocrinological aspects as in the context of sort of obesity driven pancreas cancer and beyond sort of my medical training had very little background in diabetes or endocrinology. Um, and Yale had a great has a great diabetes research center, really fantastic investigators in that space, not a lot of whom are working in, in cancer biology. And so I had some unique tools and unique knowledge, even though I was a junior investigator, that they could take advantage of in that collaboration. Um, and I, I sort of highlighted that when I met with them and that gave, a, gave them something to think about in terms of you know, possibilities. If they're going to collaborate with someone in that space and in, in that particular area, I was going to be the person, at least locally, that they would have to do that with, right? And mm -hmm. so again, uh, we talked about proximity being helpful, not essential, but helpful, and maybe advantageous for types of things. I think that was uh, one way that you could sell yourself as a junior investigator. You're bringing sort of new tools, new technologies, new ways of thinking um, that would be enticing for sort of the, the more senior um, colleagues. But I think, you know, don't be hesitant and, and don't be hesitant, not only in reaching out, but also in sort of uh, demonstrating what your strengths and expertise are and how you bring something unique to that collaboration. And mm -hmm. if I can add to what Mandar said, which I agree fully, I would say try to bridge the link. So if you are still, maybe you're a postdoc and you're trying to kind of start a, and soon you're going to start your lab and you want to start already collaborating with someone more senior, maybe finding your network. Who knows that senior person? Who can connect you? Because sometimes senior individuals are very busy, as we all know, and they probably don't respond all the emails that they have or all the DMs that they, you know, receive. And so try to find that link. If you don't have anyone in your network, maybe try to attend a conference that you know that person is going to be at, right? A smaller conference maybe sometimes are helpful because they allow for more networking 
on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And last, if you don't have any other, you know, any other way, just email until you, you need to persist until you get that response, but always making that emphasis on what is different about you, why, why you should be the person to be collaborating, even if you are at a junior stage. Absolutely. Yeah, I would like to emphasize the conference aspect. Um, I feel like most of the exciting collaborations that I'm involved in started over, you know, just like a coffee or a beer, or just chatting at a, at a conference. Um, and yeah, I would like to echo what you guys are saying. Just don't be afraid to, to reach out. Um, you know, Courtney, and just to add it to that, for example, you know, when I was a postdoc and I was uh, when I was a graduate student and I was not even in the field of pancreatic cancer, I went to one of these Gordon conferences on pancreatic diseases. And that's how I started making, you know, my way through the community. And so reaching out to those, I think it's, it's definitely important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we only have time for one more question. Um, this one is coming from the audience and I'm going to open it up to whoever wants to respond. Um, can you talk about if or how your institutions support and recognize collaborative work? Like, does it count towards tenure, for example? Um, I'm happy to mention this. I, this is something that comes up, I think, a lot. And so I guess one one part of this is that, like, the, the, the culture changes as, like, we as, like, scientists and investigators, like, elect to change it, right? So, like... You know, I think that the way biological science is transforming, I mean, it, it's 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 more and more challenging to sort of accomplish the like, you know, the, the accumulate the amount of data or, or and the multidisciplinary aspects of uh, um, of research that are required to make real insights um, than ever before. And so so these collaborations are really like essential to gaining true knowledge. And so so the first thing to say is like don't don't be afraid that you're going to be under recognized if you like are part of a collaborative effort, you know, and this relates a little bit to the also the prior question about like what do you do with a senior colleague? I mean, also, don't be afraid to make sure that your voice is heard in terms of what's important to you, right? Like, so if you're engaging in a collaboration with a senior colleague, like when you start building out a project, you don't don't like sublimate your need to say like, hey, like I really need to be corresponding author on like the first manuscript or something like that, you know? Because what you don't want is to end up in a situation where you're afraid to say something that actually really matters to you professionally. And then you end up in a weird situation where you've been involved in something for a few years and then assumptions were misaligned. So don't, so A, like, don't be afraid to say the things that are important to you. Like it's, you know, right? Like this is your like life's work, right? Um, and then the other thing is I would say, generally speaking, I've actually, because, I, because I'm engaged in such a deep collaboration, I've asked my institution about this. And the general rule I've gotten from them is like, as long as what you publish is like also relevant to what your lab does, then it counts. If you basically are like, well, like I like, you know, work on T cell metabolism. And then I was part of like a collaboration on like something totally different. I don't know, like kin selection in squirrels or something like they're going to be like well I don't it's a cool paper I don't know that it's necessarily going to contribute to your tenure promotion right so I think that what what the, the question is whether it's collaboratively or on your own are these things that are building that the narrative that defines like your 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 sort of like career body of work yeah I agree with that yeah, I think there's a def definitely different types of collaborations and some collaborations you do for the sake of science because we're all scientists and if we have a tool that can help others, uh, I'll definitely collaborate if it's in line with, uh, you know, the, the major kind of theme of the lab, of our lab, but even if it, I'm not the, you know, the corresponding author on the paper. Um, but uh, I, I agree with Santosh that uh, when uh, uh, you have more in-depth collaborations, just make sure to communicate, make sure you have complementary expertise that you bring so that uh, it's recognizable when there's a publication at the end of the collaboration. Absolutely. And then, and then finally, just to quickly add, there are more and more grant mechanisms that support collaboration at you know, co-PI, multi-PI level. Um, stand up to cancer, uh, UK grand challenges, even foundations like the Damon Runyon, Lost Garden Foundation, Pancreas Cancer, they all have sort of collaboration grants or opportunities for collaborative grants where it's equal recognition, equal PI type status, which 
institutions generally do appreciate that funding coming in. So. For sure. Cool. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. Um, it was really great hearing about your research. I'm now going to turn it back over to Megan for some concluding remarks. So Damon, Rani would like to thank our panelists and our excellent moderator, um, and we hope the audience enjoyed today's discussion. I will be reaching out via email with a recording of today's webinar along with a feedback survey. So keep your eyes peeled for that email. And then also look out for um, future Catalyst webinars. We will hold our next webinar in the middle of the summer. Okay, great. Well, thank you again and everyone have a nice day. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.